Good morning. Welcome to Wake Up with Ashland. My name is Eric Brooks. I am the curator here at Ashland. It's great to be with you this morning. Um, here at the beginning of fall, we hope you are doing well and enjoying the first days of fall and the wonderful fall weather and whatnot. So we're pleased to see you again. Um, I want to thank the Pre-Mutual Funds, our sponsor of this series, who has allowed us to bring you these videos for the last, I'm well, getting on almost five months now, probably four or five months. We've been really glad to do that. It's been a lot of fun. We've been able, we've been very pleased to be able to share with you some things in the collection that aren't often or as easily shared and some stories that perhaps we don't often tell. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Sue. A couple of our volunteers. Thanks for tuning in. It's always great to see you every morning when we do this. Appreciate you being here. So today we're going to take a special moment. Uh, good morning, Joyce Probus. Nice to see you watching. We're going to talk about a current event and look at its antecedent. This is a case where a current event was preceded by and uh, begun by something involving Henry Clay. Today, at the end of the day, the United States will begin to undertake the most solemn ceremony our government can. Uh, it will place one of its high officials in state in the Capitol Rotunda. That official, of course, is Supreme Court Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She will lay in state tomorrow um, where people can pay their official respects at the Rotunda. She has lain in state the last couple of days on the steps of the United States Supreme Court. Um, she will be the 35th individual to lay in state in the United States Capitol. Uh, there are several important things to note. She is the first woman ever to lay in state in the Capitol. And the second woman, uh, good morning, Diana Drabaugh, another volunteer, the second woman ever to lay in the Capitol at all. There are two types of ceremony. Good morning, Mary, another volunteer uh, that take place of this type. One is laying in state, and that is for officials of the government people who are high government officials, who are in service of the government, and that includes members of the military. The other is laying in honor. Uh, that's a relatively recent phenomenon. There have only been four total individuals honored in that manner. Um, and when someone lays in honor, it's someone who has given great service to the country, but is not necessarily a member of the government. Good morning, Zach Kinslow and Lydia Phillips. And good morning, Gaynell Warren and Rex Sandifer. So four people have laid in honor. Those four people are Billy Graham, Rosa Parks, the first woman to lay in the United States Capitol, and two United States Capitol police officers who were killed in the line of duty, uh, I think 1998. So uh, that's a relatively rare phenomenon. Um, but of the 35 people, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she is the first woman to lay in state. She is also the first person of, uh, first Jewish person to lay in state and only the second Supreme Court justice ever to lay in state. Interestingly enough, the first person who did that was Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, but he was also President of the United States. In fact, interestingly enough, he was President first and then Chief Justice. And Cameron, I got this wrong when we were talking yesterday. That individual is William Howard Taft. Um, and so one can wonder whether Taft would have lain in state if he hadn't been president. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is the first Supreme Court justice to lay in state exclusively for her service to the court. So uh, that's really an interesting event. Um, I hope many of you will tune in uh, to watch that on TV tomorrow. Um, if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, that might be an interesting opportunity. Good morning, Elaine McDonald. Uh, nice to see you watching. So I want to go back now to the very first laying in state in the United States Capitol. That happened on July 1st, 1852. And the person who was the first person to lay in state in the United States Capitol was Henry Clay. Now, Henry Clay died on June 29, 1852 at 11.17 a.m. in room 32 of the National Hotel. This hotel was at 6th Street Northwest in Pennsylvania Avenue, so not far at all from the Capitol. Um, it no longer stands. The building was raised, I believe, in the 1940s. Um, there have been a number of buildings there. Uh, the last thing that I know of that was there was the museum. Unfortunately, that is also now closed. So I don't know what, if anything, is currently on the site. Um, he died in the presence of his son, Thomas. Thomas is the man seated next to him. Thomas 
Hart Clay had gone up several weeks earlier to be with his father in his last days. This man is Senator Jones. Senator Jones was a former governor and senator of the state of Tennessee. He lived upstairs from Henry Clay at the National Hotel and had come down at the time that Henry Clay died. Another person who was likely in the room but is not in this engraving can be seen in this reproduction of a painting, and the original of this is at the Kentucky Historical Society. That is James Marshall. Henry Clay hired James Marshall in 1849 as a manservant. He was not enslaved. He was a free man. Clay paid him for his services, and he worked for Clay until his death in 1852. So very interesting individual. Uh, very interesting that one of the last African Americans in Henry Clay's life was a free man. So Clay dies June 29, 1852. Uh, his body is taken and prepared. The United States Senate pays a great deal of money uh, for that to happen. Uh, the body is placed on ice until it can be placed in the coffin. Uh, and then eventually on the 1st, he lays in state in the Capitol. Now, uh, we have a lot of information about that. I want to show you this document. This is a patent drawing of what is called the Fisk Metallic Burying Case, invented by a man named Almond D. Fisk. Now, this was a state-of-the-art piece of burial apparatus in use during this period. It was cast iron uh, at the face up here there would be a glass plate over which was a metal plate fastened by screws. So you could take the screws loose, swivel the plate out, and look through the glass to see the decedent inside. This is, you can see, uh, human-shaped or mummiform. Uh, by virtue of its shape and being cast iron and the fact that it was bolted shut, it preserved the body very nicely. And this was a time when embalming was not a practice used in American funerals. Henry Clay was actually buried in one of these coffins. Uh, it was actually provided by the company that manufactured them. By the time Clay died, Almond D. Fisk had actually passed himself and was in repose in one of his own coffins. So, But one of the, the, the current president of the company came to Washington, especially to prepare the body and uh, install it into the coffin. Uh, this is a photograph of Henry Clay's coffin. You may wonder how this happened. Uh, in the 1950s, 1952, I believe, a historian by the name of Winston Coleman had gone to the Lexington Cemetery to see the monument and noticed that it seemed to be in a state of some disrepair. He was concerned about the condition of the, the sarcophagus and the fact that it appeared that water may have entered it. So he got with the cemetery and they arranged uh, to have the sarcophagus open and have things inspected. Uh, they found the coffin to be in excellent condition, uh, as you can see here. Um, uh, that's how it looked. Um, so all in all, it was in good shape. They resealed it. The coffin had three plates. The face was covered by a plate featuring acorns, a common symbol used on coffins. At the middle was oak leaves and acorns. You see the empty caps, that's a symbol of death or passing on, it's got Henry Clay's name, and there was a rose at the bottom. So this was all on Henry Clay's coffin, and this coffin was in use when he lay in state. And what they did was, again, unbolt the panel at the top, this panel, so that it could be swiveled so that you could see his face. And that remained the case. Clay went on a national tour all through the Northeast, and for the first several stops, at least, they did this. Eventually, they stopped doing it because I guess it became impossible to continue to look upon him after he'd been in the coffin for a period of time. I don't know exactly how many people attended, but all of the members of Congress, the president, high officials of government were there. Uh, the family had, uh, Thomas was there representing the family. Uh, friends of Clay came. Um, so there were a number of people there. Uh, and I do believe a large number of, uh, number of members of the public filed past uh, to see this event. Clay was placed on a catafalque, and a catafalque is essentially a wooden platform covered in black cloth on which the coffin rests. Um, there is a catafalque in use today that actually came with the second laying in state, and that was Abraham Lincoln. That catafalque will be used tomorrow for Ruth Bader Ginsburg and is currently the one regularly used for these events. If you want to see that catafalque, you can actually see it. Uh, if you go to the United States Capitol Visitor Center, 
Um, and I don't know that it's actually open right now, either because of COVID or because of the events of the next few days. But if when it is open, you visit, you can go to the back of the visitor center in the in the exhibit area, and there's a window into the vault where the catafalque is kept, and you can see it. It's really quite interesting. Um, I quite enjoyed seeing it. And this will give you some idea. This is uh, the funeral car. So this is what the body was put in. I don't know that all of this was present when he lay in state, but that was in New York City. So that's what they did when they took him out of the Capitol. So um, that's how they did that. Good morning, Ruth Ann Ritter. Um, so Diana, glad you're enjoying it. Yeah, these photos, this is the kind of thing we get to do here. We take stuff out of the files that don't come out all the time and talk about artifacts we don't always get to talk about. Uh, I frequently do this at the cemetery. Uh, and we'll bring the photos with me, but it's neat to be able to do it today uh, and talk about these events. So we have a couple of artifacts in the collection that relate to these events uh, that actually may have been on the coffin at the, at the laying in state in Washington. And it's pretty amazing to have some artifacts of that sort. The first is this. And that's a you know, fairly ordinary looking piece of black cloth. I'll get in here. I don't know if you'll be able to tell. It's actually black velvet. It's been adhered to a blue piece of paper. Um, try to get that way. But it's a pretty ordinary looking piece of fabric. You wouldn't think much of it, and without the note at the bottom, you wouldn't think much about it at all. Um, and it might not have been saved, uh, except that the individual who did knew what it was and was kind enough to write that down. So when Henry Clay's coffin was prepared, both the coffin and the outer boxes that contained it, and there were at least two described in the in the uh, congressional accounting of this, and we have a complete accounting from, from the National Archives of all of the expenses that Congress, the Senate specifically, incurred in Henry Clay's funeral. Uh, but both the coffin and the outer cases were covered in black fabric. And in fact, there's a specific mention of black velvet. Um, they paid $317 for a variety of pieces of fabric, part of which was black velvet. So I believe this is a piece of that black velvet that was on the coffin in Washington and continued to be on the coffin until it arrived in Lexington uh, and Clay was buried. When that happened, this piece of cloth was trimmed, cut off, and given to a young boy who happened to be at the, well, not young, a teenage boy, who happened to be at the funeral. Uh, his name uh, was Ayucho. That was his last name. Uh, his father, Wilhelm Ayucho, was the director of music at the Christ Church Episcopal downtown, uh, where the Clays attended. Uh, Wilhelm Ayucho also taught Lucretia Clay piano, so he was a good friend of the family. And this was given to his son as a memento. His son attached it to the blue paper and wrote a note explaining all of that. So we know what this is because he took the time to record that information. So we're very, very fortunate in that regard. So this was there the first time someone lay in state in the United States Capitol, we think. This may also have been, this is kind of a mystery. Uh, one of the things that happened here over the years, and this really started in 1950, I'm trying to get out of the light here so you can see it, um, the, the family left a lot of stuff in the attic and in other places in the house. And it took us 50 years to sort through it all, organize it, number it, and research it, and we're still doing some research. I mean, we haven't certainly haven't figured out everything. And this is a piece that I have a pretty good idea about, but I don't know for sure. It is silver, coin silver. Obviously, it is of some importance. I mean, it's got Henry Clay's name on it. The eagle with the wreath surmounts that. Uh, so, and it's a pretty impressive piece. And you can see there are little little tiny holes at the points of this shield-shaped object. So the question is, what is it? Well, I think it seems pretty clear. Get over here, maybe we can see a little better. Uh, that it is meant to label something, meant to go on an object to identify it as Henry Clay's or relating to Henry Clay. So the question is, what is the object? Well, it would have to be pretty good size. This object, I'll put my hand next to it, you can see, probably five or six inches across and five or six inches the other way in width. So it's a pretty decent sized plate. You know, there aren't a lot of things that's going to go on. Um, so it's going to have to be a fairly sizable piece. We know, like I say, from the congressional accounts and other accounts, that the iron coffin in which Clay reposed, especially for transport, was transported in a mahogany case and a cherry case. And at least the mahogany case was identified as having silver trappings, uh, silver handles, and a silver nameplate. I think this is the nameplate 
from the carrying case for Henry Clay's coffin. Good morning, Kuniko. Nice to see you. Good morning, Brandy. Um, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, this is certainly fancy enough to have been something like that. And the eagle carrying the wreath is a symbol frequently seen on things related to death uh, and the deceased. A uh, wreath of honor being held over their head. Good morning, Wood um, and Dawn. Now, Wood is actually a descendant. Nice to see you this morning. Good morning, Dawn. Glad to see you're joining us. So I think that piece was on one of those cases and may have, again, been in Washington at the time that Henry Clay laid in state. I hope sometime I'll find more exact information, um, but I think the conclusion that I've reached is fairly reasonable. So interesting artifacts to have about this important moment in our nation's history and to think about as we approach uh, tomorrow's laying in state. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Good morning, Joe. Well, if there are no questions, I thank you very much for joining you, for joining me today, and I hope that uh, as you see coverage of and perhaps watch the proceedings tomorrow, you'll remember what we've talked about today. Thank you very much. Everyone have a great day, and we'll be back next week with Wake Up with Ashland. How long was the tour? Joe Fryman asked how long the tour was. Good catch. Glad you caught me. Uh, so... Clay left Washington on July 2nd or 3rd. He arrived in Lexington on July 9th, so six days. He went to up Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, across New York State to Buffalo, down across Lake Erie to Cleveland, diagonally across the state of Ohio to Cincinnati, up the Ohio River to Louisville, back from Louisville, again overland, back down to Lexington. So it took six days. They got him here on the 9th. They had a funeral for him out front uh, at Ashland on the 9th, or uh, on the 10th, rather, the next morning, and then buried him down at the cemetery. That's a whole other uh, wake up with Ashland. And maybe a little later in the year, I'll go over to the cemetery and, and do something there. Because um, that's a whole interesting story in, in and of itself. How airtight was the coffin? Well, I've never tried one, but pretty airtight. They were actually pretty successful in what they did. Um, so they worked pretty well in terms of preserving the body. Um, they actually had one other purpose, and uh, that has to do with the glass piece over the face. People had a terrible fear during this period of being buried alive, and there were actually a number of devices, like, for example, a bell that was mounted on the tombstone with a rope going down into the grave, so that if you were buried alive, you had a way to at least let people know you were there, assuming somebody was standing around when you rang the bell. But this was designed to work in such a way that if you put a living person in it and closed it, their breath would fog up the glass. I don't know of any cases where they actually saved someone from being buried as a result, but that was the idea. But I think it was reasonably airtight. Well, thank you for the questions. Those were great questions. Are there any other questions today? Good morning, Don. Well, again, thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Have a good week. Good morning, Karma.